my name is Jay Sugarman, and I want to welcome you to Museum Open House. This ongoing series features and highlights many of the outstanding museums and other cultural institutions. The main purpose of most programs is to inform viewers about current and upcoming exhibits, various programs, resources, and other opportunities that are available for the general public. Today via Zoom, we're fortunate to have as our guests Alex Gomberg and Barry Joseph from the Brooklyn Seltzer Museum, which is located in the active factory of the Brooklyn Seltzer Boys. Alex is the vice president of the company and Barry is a digital experience designer. And he's also the author of the very informative, engaging book entitled Seltzertopia, The Extraordinary Story of an Ordinary Drink. Together, they are the co-curators of the Brooklyn Seltzer Museum. During the program, we're finding out why and how the museum came about and how it's grown, developed, and operates today. We'll go on a behind the scenes tour and in the process, come to better understand and appreciate the layout of the museum and the many opportunities that are available for the general public. Let's start by meeting Alex and Barry and then hearing all about the Brooklyn Seltzer Museum. Welcome. So delighted you're both able to be here. Glad to be well, here. Thank you so much thank for you. having us. Thank you. You know, I found out about the museum through a previous guest, uh, Jane August, and I've had so much fun reading about the museum, watching some video footage of different events, eager to find out more and have you inform viewers. But before we jump right to that, I think it would be of interest if each of you would just briefly share a little bit more about your background, professional interests, positions. Alex, would you start, please? Sure. So my name is Alex Gomberg, uh, and I'm the fourth generation in my family to be in our family seltzer business. Uh, dates back to 1953 when my my great grandfather actually started our, our family business. It was called Gomberg Seltzer Works. And it was just one of the many factories that seltzer men would come to to have their bottles filled. It was very common for people to get home delivery of seltzer. So uh, our, our family was a hub for uh, the seltzer men to come in. We filled their seltzer bottles, and then those seltzer men, those independent seltzer men, would go on their routes and deliver to their own customers with their own trucks and so so forth. It wasn't until 2012 when my family got back into the delivery end of the business, um, and we formed Brooklyn Seltzer Boys, a delivery company of Gomberg, and that you know kind of just took off. We, we mainly targeted bars and restaurants, and um, now we have a lot of home delivery customers and we're just continuing to do it. We're one of the only ones standing left. Very nice. Country. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Barry, welcome a little bit about yourself, please. Thanks, Jay. I'm a digital experience designer. I run my own company, but over the last uh, two or three decades, I've mostly done that work in the nonprofit space and the educational spaces, often with museums. I spent six years actually in the education department at the American Museum of Natural History here in New York City. Back in 2004, I had an idea to write a book about seltzer. It turned out there had never been a book for adults explaining the history of seltzer water. Uh, and through that, I got to meet amazing people um, like Alex's uh, father, Kenny, who were keeping it running around the country. And Kenny played a big part in my book, which eventually came out in 2018. You mentioned it, Seltzertopia. Alex, I met at the time as well, and he's actually in the epilogue of the book. The epilogue of the book is about where, looking back at around 2000. 14, 15, what's the future of seltzer? And I, don't, I don't mean seltzer you can get in the store, but you know, the seltzer that you might get in a you know, beautiful glass siphon and the old, the old tools that were used and still can be used for triple filtering the water and delivering them to people's homes and to businesses. So Alex at the time was positioned as the future of seltzer. Uh, and he very much was. And um, things changed during the pandemic for his family's business and they moved into a new space. So I think it was, let's see, we're right now in 2024, so 2022. Just about two years ago right now, um, I was excited for Alex to invite me to come see the new factory. Mm. And when I walked in and I saw what he'd done with the place, it was, as I say, museum at first sight. It was a beautiful new space, a beautiful factory. Uh, it was clean. The machinery was working beautifully. But he had also taken so many of the um, the artifacts from the process of fixing the machines, of running the machines, of the old machines themselves that were missing parts, and had displayed them in such a beautiful display put them in such a beautiful display that it was clear he wanted to 
educate people. Mm -hmm. And he told me about some of the things he'd been doing with local school groups to educate young elementary school kids about how a siphon works, about how you can take the tin off the top with tools and then eventually fill it up on the machine. And so we we talked about well, what would it look like to actually put a layer on top of the museum, excuse me, put, put a layer on top of the factory that would be a museum layer. It would always be a factory when it was running, but there would be something you could always see on the wall. There would be times when the factory would be closed that we can bring things out, wheel them out onto the floor. And so we spent a whole year exploring ourselves with graduate students at both NYU and Teachers College at Columbia to see what might that interactive experience be. And then starting a year ago, now, uh, May of last year, starting to make it open for the public and experiment with how a museum could be integrated into um, an active factory. And you might go to like the Ben and Jerry's factory where you can look out a window, you know, in Vermont or go to the Mint in Philadelphia and again, look down at the window at the floor. We're not talking about having a separate section that's the museum. The museum is in the factory. You're in the factory when you're in the museum. And so it's been an incredible adventure. And I feel very fortunate to work with, with both Alex, his dad, Kenny, and the whole family um, to figure out how to activate this space so that visitors can be coming in on a weekly basis and experience both the factory itself and see how it works and also all of the incredible different e exhibits that we've made to help engage people and, and educate them about the history of seltzer water in the world and specifically in New York City. Fantastic. For those who haven't had the chance to visit yet, before we enjoy and learn from a series of images and a video clip, would either or both of you give an overview of the layout and what we can look forward to seeing on a visit? Well, now, typically, so the yeah, yeah, you, you start. I'll, 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 I'll describe the physical space and you can talk about the tour. How's that sound? Sounds good. So when you walk in on the right is very much what I first saw when I first visited Alex there two years ago. Uh, there's a scaffolding in place that's holding materials that they need to run the factory. But underneath it, they become like museum alcoves. And it's full with a history of the machinery used to create carbonated water. And as you walk through it, it educates you through the objects, through digital interactives, through signage, to understand how water comes into the building and leaves a seltzer and all the steps along the way. On the left, starting at the top, is a beautiful artistic display of maybe about a, a hundred different seltzer siphons, clear ones, blue ones, yellow ones, green ones. Below that is a timeline that goes back thousands of years to the beginning of seltzer being created by the earth coming up through the ground, ending with the creation of the um, Brooklyn Seltzer Boys, the business that Alex runs, as well as the Brooklyn Seltzer Museum. So you have a high line of kind of the major milestones in the history mm -hmm. of seltzer. Beneath that, and I'm sure we'll get to it, is what's coming soon, which is a cultural history of seltzer that's told in comic form. We'll get to that. At the end of that section is also a timeline, but it's the timeline that Alex was referring to the Gomberg family's four generational history in the seltzer business and how it's come together into the seltzer uh, factory that you're standing in and the museum itself. Terrific. That's essentially a long hallway. That's literally a hallway for the seltzer men to bring their trucks in and drive through. So when you're not standing there in the museum, trucks are coming and getting dropping off their empties and getting the new ones. Then once you get past that, you're now in the factory, which I'll let Alex describe, but that's the area where there's a layer on top to help you understand how the bottles are cleaned, how um, th they get filled. And then when the factory is closed, we wheel out other pieces, uh, puzzles uh, that teach you um, the, his the all the different parts uh, that need to go together uh, in the factory, um, uh, an egg cream station where you can get your uh, get uh, unlimited egg creams, uh, chocolate or otherwise, hmm. um, uh, videos that were made for the exhibits that interview the customers about what seltzer means for them, um, the environmental impact of, of getting locally uh, triply filtered seltzer. Um, and of course, um, if you can show one of the images with our, our mascots, uh, we have both little, uh, we have um, Spritz the Siphon on, uh, on, on the left side of the image as you look at it, um, who's our mascot, and then Lil Spritz, L-I-L, Lil Spritz, who's the little child siphon. And the two of them are there to take photos with them. And in fact, there's um, holes cut out for the faces. You can you know put your face in and have a photo. So you can be Spritz the Siphon if you're an adult or Little Spritz if you're a child. You know, uh, major parts of the exhibits you think I've left out there? No, I mean, you, you cover you cover a lot. And as Barry mentioned, we do actually have to close the factory in order to do these tours. Um, you know, we, we don't want a slippery floor. We don't want anybody to get hurt. We don't want trucks, you know, coming in and out of the building. So we do we do this only on Fridays right now, uh, every single week. 
uh, right, right, just about right after we close on a Friday that, you know, the trucks are all out for delivery. So, um, you know, we, we, we open the space on Fridays and then we'll do it on, on weekends for, um, private groups, you know, about 20 people or more. And we do that, you know, pr pretty, a, a couple times a month. Um, so we're, we're, we're pretty busy and, um, what's really great. What's really fun is yes, this is still a working factory. So you, we get to, once we see the, you know, the, that long hallway, as Barry talked about, you get to go in the back and you actually see how the museum works. Mm, so the factory. as we explained in the beginning, right. As we explained in the beginning, the old machinery that are about a hundred years old and we use for parts now, uh, the machines in the back are set up just the same exact way. So you could see the whole process from triple filtering to chilling, to carbonating, to, to filling, you see the whole process. And then after we see the bottles being filled, after the, you know, our, our visitors can see that they actually get to hold and spray a seltzer bottle. We have a little, we call it a spritzing station. <laughs> uh, so somebody could actually get behind and they can video. And that's kind of like a fun treat that they get to do it, you know, uh, at, 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 to end up our tour. And then after that, we, we just, just like, as you see here in the image, we make everybody an egg cream. We have a little, it's a tour and a tasting. So you get to taste the seltzer. We make an egg cream for everybody. Um, some people that, you know, have never had egg creams, they get to experience it for the first time. Um, and those who've had egg creams a long time ago, it's just like drinking an old memory. It's, it just, it just makes people feel so good to, you know, to be able to drink it. And, and especially with the right stuff, you got to have Fox's You Bet Syrup, you got to have a cold milk and you got to have Brooklyn seltzer. You just, you just got to do it that way. Um, for sure, for sure. Um, and well, Jay, we're, we're still learning how to activate the space. It's still an experiment for us. So every month we try and do one special event on the weekend. So last fall for Open House New York, where facilities that are usually closed to the public get opened up, we opened up the museum all day and we had hundreds of people coming through. Uh, in December, we did a family seltzer party that was geared for the, the children, um, the, the under 12 and then the under 18 sec. And we did all sorts of things with bubble parties and children's book readings and stuff like that. We had, they had the, these, the siphons that are like the size you're used to. Alex has ones that are about like this big. They're, I think they're called send ups, really tiny ones. And so the kids get to make their own egg creams with their tiny little siphon, adorable. And then in March, we did the first uh, egg cream invitational where on uh, National Egg Cream Day, which is March 15th every year, um, we had a major event where we brought uh, and invited seven different local businesses, including one from Philadelphia. We had judges coming in from as far away as Florida. And for over two hours, um, three judges um, tasted egg creams from made fresh right in front of them from the seven different restaurants to decide who was making the best egg cream of 2024. And then we also gave out awards for the best presentation when it was put in front of them, the best taste when they tasted it, and the best job of this performance of putting it together. And we had it, the whole place was packed from beginning to end uh, with people from New York City who paid to come in and experience it. We have a video coming out soon that I'm right. really excited about. Here's this is, and by the way, this this was an invitation only event. Really, it started as um, because we invited the restaurants and we allowed them to bring you know a certain amount of guests, and the judges were able to bring a certain amount of guests, and then. You know, Barry and I talked to ISIS. We have a little bit of room left. Maybe we'll just invite, you know, a couple people. So we send it out on our mailing list, which is Barry, maybe like a, a few thousand, a thousand, two thousand, yep. a few thousand now. Um, people were begging. They were calling, you know, Barry, like last minute, can I get a ticket? We're sold out. So, and we only have so much space. This is not a very big build. It's about 5,000 square feet. So, ne you know, you talk about having the event next year. We're going to have to either open up the walls or something, or I, I don't know, because we, we, we did not have enough room and there were a lot of people that were upset that they couldn't come. Well, and it was such I, a That's why event. we broadcasted it, right, Barry? Didn't we? Yeah, we had yeah. two different live streams of it online. We had hundreds of people watching online live. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, I had a, the good fortune to watch some video footage of it and the enthusiasm among all the participants, uh, both the vendors and the visitors was over the top, um, definitely could have done double or triple the amount of uh, people. It's incredible. And hopefully it'll go on to be an annual event, um, remain to be seen. And here we see the winners, I believe, from uh, yes. Philadelphia of all places. So let me explain. What we're, what we're passing over here, what I'm handing over is what we call the golden siphon. Uh, this is one of the fun things that Alex and I get to have. We come up with these crazy ideas and then we get to make them. So this is a regular siphon. We filled it with these gold colored beads. So it looks, it's like holding gold. And then we spray painted a metallic gold on the tin. It's tin, right, Alex? On the, it's, yeah, the, it's block tin and copper, basically, the heads. Yeah. 
and then then put it back on. So it's the golden siphon, and that was there on a podium the whole time. And then we have here um, uh, Ryan and his brother from the Phil uh, from the Franklin Fountain in Philadelphia, the out of town guests who blew everyone away. And you can see they're holding their their winning egg cream, which was actually a, you know most people who make egg creams it's fairly standard. You know you might change the order, you might change the amount, but it's chocolate syrup, usually you bets. It's uh, milk, uh, all, both of them really cold, and seltzer. They went all the way back to the 1890s and found a recipe called an egg cream, uh, which is, again, not a traditional recipe, but it was called an egg cream that included not only vanilla syrup and some spices, but also four eggs. And so you can see the foam it, it had on the top was it blew all the other egg creams away, and they dramatically put uh, the flat pretzel right across the top. It was quite a beautiful presentation. Um, they drove all the way out from Philadelphia with their families and their little kids uh, to compete that Friday. And so we we were sad to see it leave New York. We were surprised, but we were delighted that that they were rewarded for really going way beyond uh, what was necessary. And we're so excited now that the Golden Siphon, for anyone who's in Philadelphia, you can go by the Franklin Fountain and you can see it there. That's fabulous. That's fabulous. I mean, this is just another example of what I like so much about the museum and what you've been up to is the playfulness that you bring to the institution in addition to being so informative, historical, contextual, but to make it so engaging uh, just adds to the overall experience and can easily see why it's turned out to be such a popular venue in such a short time. Um, really fabulous. You know, we're fortunate to have a short video clip that uh, Rob Martinez did um, a little while ago. Alex, I know you're on it and you informed me before, this has been viewed by over 350,000 people to give a little sense of the inner workings of the museum before we continue. So let's enjoy this clip and then continue our conversation. So this is a museum of seltzer. Yes, this is the only seltzer museum in the country that I'm aware of. When you come here, you're not only visiting the museum, but you're actually visiting a working factory too. So my name is Alex Gomberg. I'm fourth generation in our family's seltzer business. So my great grandfather started Gomberg Seltzer in 1953. If you lived in Brooklyn in the probably 30s, 40s, 50s, you had seltzer delivery. Just like the milkman, everyone had milk delivery. Seltzerman ring doorbell, seltzerman. Back in the day, there were hundreds and hundreds of seltzer men and dozens of bottling facilities just like this. And right now, there are only three left in the entire country. So I can try one? Heck yeah. Do you want a cup or do you want to do it the real way? The real way. Oh. Most of our customers drink it straight. Some people make egg creams. It's a chocolate milk with seltzer. That's, it's, it's, it's that simple. It's actually great. I'm such a child. The message of Brooklyn Seltzer is to show that an old business like this can still exist and is going to continue to keep going. That's so fabulous. Um, Alex, I can see you're definitely a professional the way uh, <laughs> you're able to down it. Um, that is so interesting and um, can see again why the popularity is there. Um, you know, looking back, um, could you imagine that you would have something like this going in such a short time? What are some uh, reflections or impressions from the beginning? Both of you. Alex, can I go first? Then I'll add mine. Please. Yeah, I mean, as far as as I mean, as far as the museum, it's listen. It was it was a it's a great idea. You know, not that I think he was crazy for coming up with it, because because Barry was really the catalyst for this this whole thing. I you know I. I I moved into the building and I set it up the way I set it up. But, you know, the ideas that he brought and his experience and and his connections to all these students, uh, you know, helping us uh, do it. Because we have a lot of interns that help us with all these new exhibits um, that we're putting out and all these activities for kids, too. I mean, we're we're hoping that a lot of student groups come in here as well. We're, we're going to get a lot of schools, you know, field trips and whatnot. We have so many hands-on activities. Barry was talking about the puzzles, but we have coloring and a scavenger hunt and they, they get to fix bottles with old fashioned tools and equipment and, and things like that. Just the way it's set up. It's a, it's a really fun thing. And there's, there's math to it. There's history to it. There's science. I mean, we, we come in and, and, and they see that H2O 
and CO2 makes H2CO3. And the teachers are like blown away. Like, wow, like this is like an old business that, 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 that can do all this stuff for our kids. And th these little children have never heard of this old fashioned type of business. They know, they know bubbly water. Of course they know, they know what that is, but you know, it, we, we, they get the whole history. Uh, and they 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 go home telling their parents how much they learned. It's just it's just so much fun to see the smiles on the kids' faces. And who doesn't want to you know sugary chocolatey soda you know <laughs> at the at the end of the the, the field trip? It's oh, just it's just a lot of fun. And for the adults too that they come every single week, they're they're antsy. It's like kids in a candy shop here. Um, this is some people say you made my whole you know year by by just having this this tour for them. It's it's a lot of fun. That that that's. That's the part that makes me feel really good. I have to say, as a former elementary school teacher, I would be coming as often as you would let me uh, bring my class. This would be just the highlight of the year for sure. So um, look forward to hearing all those developments. Barry, a few reflections, please. Well, sure. So when my book, South Sertopia, came out in 2018, I started a book tour of North America, which included Canada. And it's 2024. The tour hasn't ended. I gave a talk last week. I'm giving one in two weeks up in New Rochelle. So I've spoken to thousands of people on the topic. And the experience is always the same for me. It is so rewarding seeing how happy it makes the audience. It's it's like Alex said, they're a kid in a candy shop. They're little kids again. They they feel in this place where they feel safe and warm in their in their memories. This is, you know, glowing nostalgic memory of their childhood and of all these fun associations. And everyone's just got a big smile on their face at the end. The ability to make a physical space that encapsulates those experiences on a regular basis that can scale out with the numbers that we've seen, thousands of people who've come since we 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 really launched full time last August has been incredible. And we ask people to fill out feedback forms afterwards. We never assume what we're doing is right. We always want to learn and improve. And people saying like, this is the best museum I've been to in New York City. There's some great museums in New York City. I've worked at some of them. They're remarkable. For someone to say that like they're visiting from Australia, or from Sweden, or coming from Los Angeles or Florida, and this is one of the highlights of their trip in New York City, to me is just remarkable. And for us to be able to give people literally during such challenging times, such a warm, positive experience that reflects on cultural history that goes back for years, the values of a, of a, of a family run business, about the kind of relationships that are built between um, a local business that that can work with a family over multiple generations and, and then highlight those relationships and like our customer book. Um, it's just such a beautiful thing to be part of. And I feel so fortunate. No, I think now more than ever, we all need more and more of those type of experiences and opportunities for sure. And Barry, I know you mentioned that you're continuing to, to grow and Always. develop. Yeah. And upcoming soon is going to be the preview of new exhibit area and scavenger hunt. Can you uh, say a few words about those developments? Sure. Do you want me to share some images? Um, yes, please. About it? Yes, so, please. So let me first share that um, the I mentioned the entrance to the on the when you walk in on the left. It's a big wall, and we've kind of used it for for temporary exhibits. We had some art up, some original Celta art this spring, which was really fun. But we wanted to activate it as a permanent exhibit. And we really saved this one from the beginning because we knew it was gonna be one of the hardest ones to build. It's the cultural history of Seltzer. And so we've done two things. We have a, a physical, a paper-based scavenger hunt to help visitors navigate through the space. Whether you're five years old or 85 years old, um, it's a way of walking through the space and using your eyes to observe and think critically about what's here and try and capture what you can. Um, and Alex and I both give tours and we use it in different ways. So it's a tool for us to facilitate the space and let also, it can be self-directed. So one, we've now turned that into a digital mm -hmm. hunt. So now you can just use your phone and it'll give you hints along the way and tell you if you're getting it right or wrong. What we've also incorporated into it is the new wall, which is gonna be installed. By the time people see this, it should be a week or two earlier. So let me go over to uh, my images and I'll go, I'm gonna say uh, view full screen. Let me know if you see it full screen. You should see just a vertical image and black on the side. Is that yes, correct? Yes, very oh, well. It's very the cultural fizztery of seltzer it's gonna be a 25 foot wide comic mural in five panels the first one is the introduction spritz the siphon and little spritz in the cultural history of seltzer where they're going to uh, travel through time to the major milestones in the cultural history of seltzer using a time traveling fridge right the first panel 
The first panel is about the cultural history of seltzer <coughs> and health. No, mm. oh, this is the wrong panel. Yeah, so the first panel uh, in six frames is the cultural history of seltzer related to health, starting in ancient Greek, in ancient Greece, moving up through spa culture in Europe to the first bottling of seltzer to the first European style spa in America, Saratoga Springs, to being able to buy it in any store around the corner and how the health properties is what attracted people to seltzer in the first place. Uh, the second panel. Is about the cultural history of seltzer as a tasty beverage. So we start in a pharmacy in 1825 in Philadelphia when people started adding sugary uh, 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 syrup to get rid of the, the 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 bitter medicinal taste to eventually getting rid of that medicine completely. And then you could buy, you know, ice cold seltzer from a, a cart on the street to going to forget the pharmacies. Now you're in a soda shop with all sorts of crazy flavors made by soda jerks. And of course, it's in this context, we talk about, about egg creams. Uh, the third panel is about the cultural history of seltzer as a comedic device, not because you drink what comes out of it, but because you spray it in somebody's face. So we learn here about Weber and Fields in the Lower East Side in the end of the 19th century on the vaudeville stage in New York City, where seltzer siphons were used as a comedic prop, along with, you know, pies in the face and 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 axes in the head. Um, and then we go to the Three Stooges, uh, uh, Groucho Marx. We follow the connection with clowns, um, uh, like on the Howdy Doody show with Clarabelle, all the way up to um, something I'm sure many of your visitors re recall from the Mary Tyler Moore show, the wonderful phrase, a little song, a little dance. A little seltzer down your pants. We even go all the way up to The Simpsons. And then the last section, the last panel, is the cultural history of seltzer, looking at how it reinforces uh, people's identity and their sense of self. And I'm trying to advance it on my screen. Here we go. Uh, where the first three panels are looking at the history of Jewish Americans and seltzer in the business, seltzer in the homes, and then seltzer represented through through cultural products like Lou Reed's song, uh, Egg Creams, or the book For Two Cents Plain in the 1950s. And then we look at how it plays an important role for some people nationally. Um, we say we're the largest and only seltzer museum in North America because there is one in South America, huh. uh, in Argentina, and there's one in Europe, in Hungary as well. We all have different approaches. We have different histories we're talking about, but we know we're not alone. And in those countries, um, in Hungary, actually, um, the uh, uh, mixing uh, wine with seltzer is a national drink and it actually had to be protected when it became part of the, um, the EU. As a, as a national cultural uh, heritage. Um, Barry, over... unfortunately, we have to stop for the sake well, the of end. time. Uh, this was a wonderful introduction to all the new opportunities that are coming up uh, starting this weekend. Uh, so thanks so much for the overview. And again, thank both of you so much for taking the time to be here and give us the background behind the scenes tour of the museum continue success with future endeavors. Just fabulous. Thank you, Jay. And before we go, if we get to share with folks, if you want to get tickets, go to the website, brooklynseltzermuseum.org. Much of the museum is also online in our virtual museum, where you can experience a lot of what you just saw and contribute at the Seltzer Memory Wall. We can read people's memories and add your own. Mm -hmm. And very soon, go to the virtual store, where you can buy the t-shirts, get stickers of, of Spritz the Siphon, um, and until the store is up there, you can also go to brooklynseltzerboys.com, where all the, the museum items are currently being sold. Fabulous, fabulous. We'll have that contact information in the credits. So really appreciate it. Uh, and definitely look forward to visiting sometime soon. All yes, the best for now. We look forward to spritzing you then. <laughs> Also want to thank those of you watching for joining us and hope you'll be able to tune in next time. 